Welcome to Brockton City Hall and to our display honoring Frederick Douglass on the 200th anniversary of his birth in 1818. Brockton is a city of about 100,000 people located about 20 miles south of Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Lynn Smith and I'm the president of the Frederick Douglass Neighborhood Association. You know, Brockton is located about 38 miles north of New Bedford, Massachusetts, where Mr. Douglas lived from 1838 until about mid-1842. And we're almost the same distance, about 36 miles south of Lynn, Massachusetts, where he also lived for a number of years. We honor Mr. Douglas in our city with a street named in his honor, where in the 1840s he stood at our Liberty Tree close to a stop on the Underground Railroad. He spoke out against slavery. Brockton is a multicultural city, and our display highlights the connections Mr. Douglas has to many of our citizens, Haitians, Cape Verdeans, women, and the Irish. The artwork that you will see in the Douglas display has been created by a diverse group of local Brocktonians. What better location to host our Douglas Bicentennial display than this amazing building filled with priceless paintings that depict the Civil War. To share more of this story, we are honored to have with us Willie Wilson, local Brocktonian, teacher, historian, and our city tour guide, and Mr. Bob Martin, our City Hall historian. I worked here at City Hall for approximately 37 years, and Lynn is correct, I'm sort of a historian, not only of City Hall, but a love of Brockton history. Um, we're standing in, in, a, in a facility that has had its ups and downs, obviously, but um, one of the most notable parts about the City Hall is the fact that it's history again. And let me share with you a little bit about <coughs> uh, City Hall's history in itself. Uh, City Hall was built um, between 1892 and 1894 after three different uh, uh, voting initiatives uh, finally made it with a cost of $368,000. And that's including the paintings, by the way. Um, City Hall is approximately 92 feet high. It's still used as a, the center of, of municipal government. And today we're going to share a little bit about not only the significance of City Hall, but the relevance with Frederick Douglass. Thanks, Bob, for that great introduction. So we're standing here in the grand hallway of Brockton City Hall in front of the first panel of our Frederick Douglass Bicentennial display. And our local history teacher and historian, Willie Wilson, will talk to you a little bit about what this, this is on this display. Take it away, Willie. Okay, thank you. Well, this display, first of all, features Frederick Douglass, who is uh, uh, one of the most famous of uh, our Americans, African American, and was celebrating the bicentennial. Uh, as uh, some of you know, he had four children, and the oldest was born in New Bedford and, uh, in 1840. Uh, but here at this display, we're showing his uh, evolution as a speaker and an orator. And uh, it's been said that he has been one of the most photographed men of the, uh, of the 20th century. And uh, we do have pictures of him uh, from paint to portraiture. But here uh, we talk about the Douglas legacy. He lived in New Bedford. He also lived in Salem for, for a time before the move to Rochester. Uh, one of the things that are lesser known about him is he visited Worcester. Uh, in the 1840s and actually spoke against uh, the discrimination of women and uh, he was one of the first males nationally to speak up for women's rights and the right to vote for women. Uh, again, he, uh, he passed away uh, February 20th, 1895 at his home in Anacosta, uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, again, I think it, just looking at him, you could you have an idea of his stature. Frederick Douglass was born in 1818. We don't know the exact day, but he chose the date of February 14th because he said his mother often called him her little Valentine. We know he escaped from the Baltimore, Maryland area around 1838 and came to New Bedford. 
And we know around that time there was a lot of fermentation about slavery and there was a lot of talk about separation of the Union because of slavery. So Bob is going to talk about the painting that's right in back of us that really tells that story. Bob, it's all yours. Thank you. I should note that all these paintings were done with a cooperative effort by Mortimer Lamb and Richard Holland, who also employed some sketch artists as well. The painting I want to talk about that's related to uh, what I think is one of the most important, obviously important parts of Brock North Bridgewater's history, Brockton's history, is the spirit of 1861. Um, I don't know if you can capture this with the lighting, but in, the, in this portrait, which is very, very profound, you have a runaway slave that's by the fireplace, or by a fi uh, but not fireplace, I'm sorry, but by a campsite. His arm is reaching into the air to the light of freedom. The light of freedom is, is exemplified by the angel Gabriel. If you notice on, on, if it, notice the, uh, on top there, angel Gabriel. And then on, on the upper right hand corner is uh, the Grand Army of the Republic. It's kind of obscure. But I would have preferred, as I said, to Lynn to have at least one or two civilians in that corner who played a significant role in the Underground Railway. On the other side of the painting uh, is the archetypical look of the, uh, the slave hunters. There were two gentlemen and, and some ferocious looking dogs. Uh, in North Bridgewater, however, they, there wasn't two gentlemen with ferocious looking dogs. There were these obsequious individuals with handcuffs that actually we're, we're running around, not running around, but uh, looking for the runaway slaves uh, all the way down as far as I know to South Carolina. But in North Bridgewater was also a scene of where people were informing when the underground, um, sorry, on the Underground Railway and, and the, the uh, slaves that, that were um, transported all the way up to, up to Canada. So this is, this is painted uh, as a reason, a main reason, why Brockton or North Bridgewater at the time had that significance of being one of the points of the Underground Railway. It wasn't without controversy, however. They actually wanted a number of paintings, this one in particular, not to be painted and have another military, um, military painting. But this shows how the significance is of, of the, the abolition movement at the time. Brockton has a very large population of Cape Verdeans, many recent immigrants. But interestingly, when Frederick Douglass ran away and settled in New Bedford, the black shipmakers that he met in New Bedford on the wharves were most likely the first free black men that he had ever met, and they were Cape Verdean shipbuilders. And this amazing portrait that you see in back of me was done by a local artist, Daji Andrade, of a very iconic freedom flight fighter of Cape Verde, um, Amilcar Cabral. So we know that when Frederick Douglass was living in New Bedford, he started to formulate more of his thoughts about abolitions and about slavery, and really took a lot of comfort and inspiration from those free black men. So I'll turn it over to Willie to talk more about his early years. Uh, in his early years, as Lynn had mentioned, uh, Frederick Douglass was uh, befriended by many Cape Verdeans. Uh, most of them uh, were free, as Lynn had mentioned. Uh, their passports and papers of identification mentioned Portuguese uh, ancestry because uh, Cape Verde was not yet independent. It didn't achieve its independence until 1975. Uh, one of the places that uh, his first great speech uh, by, uh, on uh, liberation and anti-slavery and abolitionism was in Nantucket. William Lloyd Garrison actually recruited him to work for his organization. And so they featured uh, many articles and speeches by Frederick Douglass in that then newspaper called The Liberator. And Nantucket was, uh, was a hotbed of abolitionism uh, at that time. And so uh, we, on the island of, of Nantucket as well, there were many uh, Cape Verdean whalers and shipmen and rope makers. And so we have here uh, what we did in the Strive to Freedom exhibit in the presentation and seminar we gave some years ago was tie in together the facets, uh, multifaceted information and connections that Frederick Douglass had concerning freedom for all. Uh, d different ethnic groups as well as women. Willie talked a little bit about Cape Verde and New Bedford and the shipbuilding industry 
there. And it's interesting, too, when Frederick Douglass was a young man, some of the very first letters that he learned when he was learning how to write was thanks to the carpenters uh, down in Baltimore when they had a piece of wood that was going to go on the larboard side. They would mark it with L. When they had a piece of wood that was going to go on the starboard side, they would mark it with S. And so Frederick Douglass started to look at those letters and slowly but surely learn how to write. Not only did New Bedford have a long history of shipbuilding, but there were some very interesting innovations on the naval front during the Civil War. And Bob is going to talk about one of those innovations and the painting in back of us. Well, the Monitor in the Merrimack, as many of you know, was one of the most significant naval engagements for several reasons. By the way, first of all, it was, it was actually a draw. And neither, neither a ship actually gained advantage over the other. Both were heavily damaged. But there are two aspects of this that I think should be shared uh, today. One is that, that a number of actually North Bridgewater residents uh, worked on the, in the shipbuilding industry down in New Bedford at one time or another during the Civil War. The second is that one of the uh, North Bridgewater residents uh, actually uh, was a naval person that, that was on the, the monitor. The, monitor. Um, the relationship that we have with a number of different uh, naval engagements from, from North Bridgewater at the time, uh, this, sort of this painting sort of exemplifies that. That's why it was actually painted in the first place, even though it wasn't a significant uh, number of people from North Bridgewater. But those are two of the aspects I wanted to share today. Now we connect Frederick Douglass to the Irish American community here in Brockton. And this marvelous painting that you see in back of us of Daniel O'Connell was done by a local artist, Jean-Paul Santé, who also did a painting of Toussaint Louverture for us, which you'll see a little bit later. But Frederick Douglass had a very interesting connection with Ireland and England and the people of those days, including Mr. O'Connell. And I'm going to turn it over to Willie to comment on that more in detail. Willie? Okay. Well, uh, as many know, actually, Frederick Douglass, his, uh, he was purchased by two British women, English women, in terms of uh, his former slave owner. They actually paid to have him legally free. And then he traveled to Ireland, and he established a wonderful relationship with Daniel O'Connell. And um, I just wanted to uh, reflect. Uh, O'Connell also passionately opposed slavery. Upon meeting an American, before shaking his hands, he would routinely ask whether the visitor was a slaveholder. If the answer was yes, there was no handshake. And so uh, that kind of illustrates the passion that he felt. But he and Frederick Douglass, uh, they had a strong conviction, they got along very well, and it was a friendship that lasted for the rest of uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, career and lifetime. Frederick Douglass's first meeting with President Abraham Lincoln was as a result of Douglass's request by the President to find black men who would be willing to serve as soldiers in the Civil War. And Frederick Douglass was a little concerned because at the time, the white soldiers were being paid $13 a month, and the black soldiers were only offered $10 a month. And two of Douglas's sons actually um, signed up to serve in a very famous regiment that's close to our heart called the 54th Massachusetts. And so Bob is going to talk about the painting in back of us and the story of the 54th. This is um, one of, <coughs> thank you, Lynn. This is one of my favorite paintings of all the uh, paintings at City Hall when I do, when I do the tours. Um, the movie Glory, starring Morgan Freeman and Denzel Washington, really exemplifies the, uh, the, the core point, which is that someone of color is, is, can fight and is worth as much as Lennon indicated, as much as a white person in terms of their bravery and valor. So if you notice over here, we have it's called, well, the, the 54th fought the major battle called the assault on Battery Wagner in South Carolina across the, the bay from Charleston, which no longer, by the way, that, that, that piece of land no longer exists. This painting exemplifies the heroics of uh, both Colonel Shaw, who is their leader, and the, the members of the 54th. And, and uh, there actually were two regiments, by the way, the 54th and 55th. But what we're talking about here today is the 54th, many of whom 
many of the soldiers came from not only North Bridgewater, but all of Eastern Massachusetts. Um, again, this painting exemplifies the heroics of the 54th. <clears throat> they are on the, the redoubt, which is the, they were outnumbered approximately five to one when they crossed the beach to get to the, 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 the uh, Battery Wagner, which is the uh, battery that should, had about a whole regiment of, of Confederate soldiers. So again, you see on the, on the mount, uh, Colonel, Colonel Shaw uh, being mortally wounded and the soldiers um, not only going across into the, the uh, Battery Wagner, but also eventually they would cover his body and bring it back. The 54th, again, um, was not a major battle, by the way, assault on Battery Wagner, but again, exemplifies North Bridgewater's commitment to people of color as long ago as 1893. While we're talking about the 54th, uh, we also want to mention uh, Lemuel Ashport, yeah. who was born in Taunton in 1846. Uh, he served uh, in the 54th Regiment. He was ill and did not participate in the assault on Fort Wagner. But later on, he, uh, after he was decommissioned, most of the African-American soldiers were then, uh, during Reconstruction, assigned police duty and guard duty in the military districts, the five military districts in the South. And he was assigned in New Orleans. Uh, and later, after the war was over, many of those people, those gentlemen, became um, police officers. And Lemuel Ashport became uh, Brockton's first black police officer in the 1880s. Uh, a friend of his, James E. Adis, became uh, a, a black police officer in Boston. And so they were uh, Republicans. And uh, Ashport was born in Taunton, but he attended school in Brockton. In fact, this very site where City Hall is placed was a school, hence School Street, and he attended school here. And later on, he had several daughters, one of, which, uh, one of whom was Pearl Ashport Brooks, and she graduated from Brockton High in 1907. So the Ashport family has a, a rich history in, in Brockton's black community. When we connected Frederick Douglass to the women of Brockton, also known as North Bridgewater back in the day, we could not leave out his relationship with Susan B. Anthony and the women's suffrage movement. And the beautiful portrait of Susan B. Anthony that you see in back of us was done by a local woman artist, Susie Shaw. So I'm going to ask Willie to talk a little bit about Frederick Douglass and the women's movement back in the 1840s. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Frederick Douglass did address the women's issue in the 1840s at a speech in Worcester. But I have here a quote from a, a speech he made um, in December of 1866. And uh, he was very familiar with and worked with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as well as Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott. And Lucretia Mott was one of the individuals that actually visited along with Frederick Douglass at the Liberty Tree on High Street, which is now Frederick Douglass Avenue. This is the quote, and this is what he said. Women and the colored man are loyal, patriotic, property-holding, tax-paying, liberty-loving citizens. And we cannot believe that sex or complexion should be any ground for civil or political degradation. In our government, one half of the citizens are disfranchised by their sex and about one eighth by their color of the skin. And thus, a large majority have no voice in enacting or executing the laws that, are, that they are taxed to support and compelled to obey. With the same fidelity as the more favored class who usurped pr pr uh, prerogative, it is to rule. A little wordy, but again, showing his passion uh, and again, they were very good friends and supporters. And you know, Willie, I'm going to jump in too because we know one of the very last official acts that Frederick Douglass did was to give a speech in 1895 to a group of women activists and he went home to his house that evening and either had a stroke or a heart attack and passed away. So from the beginning to the end, he was supportive of women and the women's right to vote. Right. Very good. And it comes back to his first, being the first man to actually vote for women's rights. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. We have a very large population in Brockton of proud Haitian Americans. And so we had a local artist, the same gentleman who did the portrait of Daniel O'Connell, do this amazing portrait that highlights um, 
Haiti's iconic civil rights figure, Toussaint Louverture. Many people don't know that Frederick Douglass served as minister to Hades towards his, uh, the end of his life. And actually, he was invited to give the keynote opening speech at the World's Fair, the World's Exposition, in 1893 at the Haiti Pavilion. And so Willie is going to talk a little bit about Douglas and his service and the connection to Toussaint Louverture. Um, as we know, Frederick Douglass was a champion for, uh, he was an abolitionist, he was a lecturer, he was a statesman. He held many different um, positions during his lifetime. And, uh, and he was Consul General for Haiti. Uh, and uh, this particular painting is, is, is just remarkable, the detail. But it also speaks to some of the things he wrote about. Uh, Haiti was the first independent um, uh, nation of color in 1804. And he, during his lifetime, felt that it needed to be respected as other individual white nations. And, uh, and he fought for that vigorously. Here we are at a panel that really tells a lot of the story in a nutshell about Brockton and its connection to Frederick Douglass and also our pride in our heritage. So Frederick Douglass Avenue was named that in 2004 because our Liberty Tree, a sycamore planted in 1763, had to be taken down. So the name of the street was changed to honor Mr. Douglas, but interestingly, where that stump was left in the ground, a brand new sycamore sapling rose up and is now healthy and happy on Frederick Douglas Avenue. And that location is very important to us because that sycamore tree was the visual clue, the visual signpost that nearby was a stop of the Underground Railroad in Brockton. So I'm gonna turn it over to Willie to talk a little bit more about that stop. Uh, that stop was actually the uh, Edward Eels Bennett Stables. And his stop was one of the major stops in the Northeast for the Underground Railroad. And he was a fervent abolitionist, um, what we called a rapid abolitionist. And the difference is, Generally, abolitionists believe that African Americans should no longer be slaves. But the rabid abolitionists believe that not only should they no longer be slaves, but they should have the same rights as whites. And that's why Edward Eels Bennett is of that ilk. Most of the uh, African Americans who migrated to North Bridgewater uh, in the 1840s and 50s, and then later in the 1880s and 90s, were so enamored by Mr. Eels Bennett that they named their fraternal lodge after him. So he had a reputation that lasted right into the 20th century. And uh, in his stables on, uh, on High Street, the, that sycamore street, the sycamore tree, excuse me, was the symbol, the landmark, where all of the various groups had met, Lucretia Mott, uh, Frederick Douglass and others. So it wasn't just anti-slavery, but any time there was, they felt that there was something that needed to be re redressed in terms of freedom. And at that point, I'll hand it over. Well, to thank you, Willie, but I think you stole mo most of my thunder. Um, it was a point of political discussion, you're right? It was much more expansive than simply the abolitionist movement. And I, I think, <clears throat> as I said earlier, the spirit of 1861 was missing someone, and that was Edward Bennett, because certainly he risked his re reputation he had people who did not like him, appreciate what he was doing, because it was common knowledge that he was involved in the movement. But I think that overall, um, he had played a significant part, not only in Brockton, North Bridgewater history, but also uh, in relationship to Frederick, Frederick Doug Douglass. So. And, the, and the other issue is the, the plaque, the first plaque yes. on the tree was actually uh, instituted by the Brockton High class of uh, 1959. So there, those seniors and juniors actually pulled money together, and the senior class had the plaque placed there, and over the years it's been replaced. Brockton High was established in 1864 with its first graduating class in 1867, and they felt that it had such a connection to the school's history that it was the first time it was really designated uh, as, a, as a, a historic landmark. Mm -hmm. And it's been wonderful that that tradition has been kept up by the young people of Brockton. 
So in 2015, we wrote a grant application to Mass Humanities, and we told them the story of how Douglas was connected to Cape Verde and Haiti and women and veterans and the Irish. And Mass Humanities funded a wonderful project that we named after Dr. Martin Luther King's book on the Montgomery bus boycott, Stride Toward Freedom Path. And so in our community garden in downtown Brockton, steps from our stop of the Underground Railroad, all of the beautiful original artwork that you see has been recreated on large billboard historical signs. And so people in the community can go to that garden and read our history and what connects us in terms of our roots. Or they can go to the Brockton Public Library and a slice of our original Liberty Tree was saved and turned into a beautiful round table where you can count every ring of the tree. So I think this story, this building that we're in, the story of Frederick Douglass, the story of how he's connected to the diversity of Brockton today, the story of how he addressed so many of the issues that we're struggling with even now. You know, we're struggling with immigration now, and he gave a speech in Boston when there was an uproar about Chinese immigration, and he said, the wings of the American eagle are broad enough and strong enough to shelter all who come. So, so many of his iconic quotations we are still using today as part of the narrative of our history, and only by learning that history can we get better and build our beloved community. And, and I'm glad you mentioned that because as part of the Stride to Freedom, we, in conjunction with the Brockton Public Library, we established a book list. And that list is still on file at the Brockton Public Library with many books and articles that actually feature not only Frederick Douglass, but some of the other people that we talked about, Emmanuel mm -hmm. Cabral, Toussaint Louverture, and others. And what they talked about actually transcends generations because those same themes that uh, that Lynn had alluded to still plague us today. Yeah, it's wonderful. So we hope you've enjoyed this tour of Brockton City Hall and of our Frederick Douglass Bicentennial display. We want to all invite you all to a very special event that we are hosting. It's on April 12th. That's a Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And we have world-renowned actor, author, historian Charles Everett Pace who's going to come to our Brockton War Memorial Auditorium and give his one-man show about Frederick Douglass. And thanks to our generous sponsors, the program will be free. You do have to RSVP, so information is on our website, douglasbrockton.org, but we encourage everyone to come to that event on the 12th. And this display, Up for Black History Month in Brockton City Hall, in March, it's going to the main office of our central post office on Commercial Street. And then in August, it's going to travel to the Brockton Public Library to be displayed in their art room as well. So I want to thank you so much, Willie Wilson, for your narrative and your expertise. Bob, thank you so much for coming down. We didn't show everybody the trick about the um, earthquake-proof floor in Brockton City time. Hall. We'll <laughs> save that for the next time. But we hope you have all enjoyed this program, and we just want to say happy 200th birthday, Frederick Douglass. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you.